Thanks very much. That's great. This um, this title might seem rather ambitious, implying somehow that open data and the future of science in any fundamental way are, are interrelated, and that's indeed precisely what I'm going to argue. We've had a great deal of effort and, uh, and time expended on trying to understand how we might have open publication of science. Big data is the, is the uh, flavor of the month, but I would argue that in a fundamental way, open data is really much more important than both. Of course, all of them are in, entailed together in the same space. I should also say I, I speak as a scientist. I'm not a data manager. I'm not a data, data scientist, but as a scientist who deals with a great deal of data in his own specific domain, which is in, in glaciology. So let's get started. And a very useful way to get started is to look at a little bit of history. This fellow is Henry Oldenburg. Henry was the first secretary of the newly created Royal Society in London in the early 1660s. He was a German theologian and an inveterate correspondent. He corresponded with people that we'd now call scientists from all over Europe and indeed far beyond. And he had the bright idea that uh, wouldn't it be good to, uh, rather than keep my correspondence private, to publish it. And he persuaded the newly created society to do exactly that. So that the image you see on the right hand side of the screen is the title page of the first volume of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, which continue as a, 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 as a frank scientific journal of the present day. But Henry made two requirements of his correspondents. First was that they should write in the vernacular and not in Latin, which might not seem to be a big deal now, but it certainly was in Henry's day. And secondly, and crucially important, he required that his correspondent should not only provide the concept which they wished to argue for, but also the evidence, that is to say, the data behind it. And without those two, Henry wasn't prepared to have them work published. Historians of science now have regarded that move to publish openly and to ensure that evidence and concept were tightly connected together in that open publication uh, as the bedrock on which much of the scientific advance of the last two, three hundred years has been based. And the bedrock for two reasons, principally because it permitted others to scrutinize the logic of the argument connecting evidence and concept, and also for them to be able to replicate either the observation or the experiment, such that um, if they failed to do so, or couldn't, um, then the presumption is that the, they have effectively invalidated the concept that has been promoted, uh, which gives rise to what's been called the principle of, of self-correction in science, which means that science is very good at showing where scientific ideas are wrong. Now, there are two rather lovely uh, comments from two great scientists, one a social scientist, the other one, Charles Darwin, um, in relation to this self-correction process. Kessler writes, the progress of science is strewn like an ancient desert trail with a bleached skeleton of discarded theories which once seemed to possess eternal life. How well do we recognize that? And Charles Darwin, false facts are highly injurious to the progress of science, but they often long endure. But false views do little harm, as everyone takes a salutary pleasure in proving their falseness. But Henry Oldenburg's world and Kustler's world and Darwin's world has changed. And it's changed dramatically, and it's changed because of this, something that we all recognize, and that is that the capacity to acquire, to store, to manipulate, and to instantaneously tra transmit data has exploded dramatically over the last two to three decades. Uh, and is exponentially increasing uh, by, by, by the year. That poses both problems and really difficult problems, but it also creates opportunities. And I want to talk first a little bit about the problems, secondly about the opportunities, and then go on to say why open is such a, such a crucial concept. So let me make it personal. About 30 years ago, a pal and I published a paper in Nature in which we uh, produced uh, seven hard one data points from an experiment in a glaciated area. We described in detail the experiment, the nature of the apparatus we used. We evaluated the errors and the uncertainties uh, in such a way that others were able to uh, replicate the observations, to amend them, to add to them, and to develop the concept that we propose as a consequence. And it's now become quite a, 
quite a basic theory in glaciology. Three years ago, I was involved as principal investigator in a major experiment on the Rutland Ice Stream in Antarctica, which you see here. Um, we used a variety of sensors, and the data we collected amounts, I'm not sure, but let's say about seven petabytes rather than seven individual units of data. And even the pages of nature uh, are inadequate to contain those seven petabytes. So the crucial question for us as we prepare publication is can we prepare that material and the data in such a way that others will be able to scrutinize it with the same rigor and the same good effect that happened 30 years ago? And that is not a small challenge. It's very difficult to do. But I'm sure that others will be looking at it with some interest, particularly as I'm making the claims that I am now. This, the difficulty of doing this and some of the changes that have happened in the last year or so have produced some quite severe problems. This is a paper uh, in Nature from three years ago in which an American group looked at the top 50 benchmark papers in preclinical oncology uh, and uh, failed to replicate the research findings in 89% uh, in of cases. Only 11% of cases could they replicate the results. The reasons were various. One of them was fraud. People had invented data. But quite a number were as a consequence of either the data or the metadata, that is to say the data that permits you to use the metadata, were either not present or incomplete. Our argument in our Royal Society report was that a fundamental principle must be, as it has been for much of the history of science, that the data providing the evidence for published concept must be concurrently published together with the metadata. And that indeed to do otherwise ought to become regarded by all, including publishers, as scientific malpractice. This is the cover of The Economist of some two years ago, with the heading, as it says here, scientists like to think of science as self-correcting to an alarming degree, it's not. What's happening now is that non-replicability is, is seeping out of the out of laboratory doors and becoming something of a concern, certainly to economists and need to many others. If we're not careful, we have a, a crisis of, of, of confidence in science such that uh, ensuring that um, the means whereby conclusions can be replicated are present. For example, in the, in the example I showed you, even if those results which couldn't be replicated, but which were due to the absence of data, even if they were correct, there was no way of demonstrating that they weren't, and therefore no, demonstrate, no, no way of, them, of validating them. Uh, in other words, that work has the same, ought to have the, the, the same status as myth. But openness doesn't really mean very much if all we do is dump data in some a recoverable archive. Uh, we've argued that uh, um, uh, for what we call intelligent openness, and, and who wouldn't want to be intelligent, that data must be discoverable. You've got to know that it exists. It's got to be accessible. You've got to be able to find it. It's got to be intelligible. You've got to be able to understand it. It's got to be accessible. You need to be able to ask questions. Does this person or this group, do they have a particular financial interest in a particular outcome? And it's got to be reusable. And only when those criteria are fulfilled, their data will properly open. But it's also crucial, of course, as many will know, that the software that manipulates data, basic data, to create the, the data that might well be publicly accessed, that software itself has got to be open simply because different groups in encoding the same equations can come up with quite different answers, and it's a serious and difficult problem. Of course, also, intelligent openness must be audience sensitive. We're very good at providing data when we do it to our fellow scientists and the metadata that they require to be able to utilize our data. But at the other end of the spectrum, we're very much less good at providing data to citizens. Now, why should we? Well, the reason we should, of course, is because many scientific opinions, views, concepts, have profound implications for social and economic life and the lives of individual citizens. And as they lose the habit of deference, then they want to know what the evidence is for this particular reaction to an infectious disease, what the evidence is for climate change, so that they might, as citizens, vote for a party that argues that one should do something about it. 
We don't do that very well. We neither provide the background, nor do we provide the data that permits them to be, if you like, in intelligent auditors of the, of the scientific views. But of course, there are boundaries for openness. Um, and we would argue, we have argued that openness should be the default position, but there need to be an underlying proportional exceptions for commercial interests, where they're legitimate, for privacy, for safety, security. The crucial point to bear in mind is that all those boundaries are fuzzy. Trying to define them precisely in a small number of words is not easy at all. In the commercial domain, for example, there are some political concepts which might require commercial, commercial bodies to open their data, and some business models now in some sectors of industry are now shifting towards a much more open approach. The boundaries are fuzzy, and if you asked a lawyer to give you an opinion about where those boundaries might lie, you're probably talking about 10,000 pages of, of, of opinion uh, and a, a lawyer who's significantly richer at the end of it. So let's move on to the benefits. I've talked about the problems. What about the benefits? Thinking about it in a rather fundamental way, I think what is clearly happening is that we've had a major technological change. We've moved from the era which, in a sense, Johannes Gutenberg, who invented movable type, the printing press, uh, that suddenly made uh, written material more, much more broadly available and at reasonable, reasonable cost, to one in which the tyranny of a library, which makes, gives, requires a location, the tyranny of the lecture hall, which requires a location, uh, the tyranny of the book, which is, is heavy and, 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 and difficult to carry around, has been broken by new technologies and have create, are in the process of creating a community which is exploiting the usability of modern technologies and therefore changing the way in which it behaves. The scientific community is in many ways rather conservative, but in my view, it's now, it's now shifting and changing. And those changes, uh, both of technology and approach, are permitting us now to utilize data on a massive scale, crucially to integrate data from diverse sources, to analyze complexity in a way that we've not been able to do so before, and of course, to, in, to con communicate it instantaneously. And if we think, in, think about what's really happening in the scientific understanding of the, of, 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 of the world, the cosmos, uh, then we're moving from a stage where um, science was good at analyzing uncoupled systems, relatively simple systems, systems such as planetary motions in which we ignore what happens way beyond the planet to one where we're looking at highly coupled systems where the, the integral component parts interact with each other to produce extremely complex behavior. We've been doing that for 30 years utilizing the modern computer where on the left hand side of this diagram you see a fractal generated by simulating the, uh, in this case a, a six component complex system in which the relationships between them are governed by some quite simple equations. We've been doing that for a long time, but now utilizing, if you like, big data, or I would rather say broad data, where we are, we are able to have take data from a whole variety of sources, then we are being able to characterize complex systems, that is to say to describe them, and putting on the one hand the description of the system, and on the other hand the capacity to, to forecast its evolution puts in our hands extremely powerful tools for scientific discovery. One obvious example is modern weather forecasting, where on this diagram you see um, an initial condition which can be deduced from surface observation on the one hand and satellite observation showing the patterns of circulation in the atmosphere. That initial condition then is an initial condition for a model um, which applies the laws of motion to the, to, to, to the system and predicts changes in atmospheric motions and characteristics. But of course, after a few, after 24 hours, after five days, after a week, after, uh, uh, after a month, model and data diverge. And of course, what we can now do is pull back the model, once that divergence has taken place, to make it fit the data. And the model also recognizes how much that has been necessary for a particular atmospheric state, such that we can, we can effectively, by iterating between model and data, we can produce forecasts that are much, much more effective than they, they have ever been in the past. We can integrate data from a whole variety of sources. At the top here, you see some historical soil maps. On the left-hand side, you see a whole series of 
some a, a, a number of variables held, for example, in the UN Environmental Programs web, website. We can integrate those to get together to give a, a much better evaluation of soil fertility than has been possible in the past. Good example, a couple of years ago when Monsanto bought for a billion dollars uh, a company which had historic rainfall, rainfall and infiltrated data, the infiltration data com complete with soil properties and their quality. And their conclusion is that this permits them to move to the production of agricultural yields at a much higher level of evaluation, crucially important in a world where food, food feeding of growing population is an important priority. Uh, there's the Internet of Things, which many of you will know a great deal about, probably more than me, uh, where let's say you have one uh, satellite, one device that's looking at the Earth's surface, it's uh, evaluating moisture levels perhaps, uh, it then needs something from the infrared domain and it, it asks another satellite to give it some information, it does, the other satellite does so, the first satellite then says, well actually this is the wrong frequency band, shift the frequency band, so it does and sends it. So the other satellite does and sends the data back, and the conclusion is that we get very increasingly sophisticated evaluations of real-time properties of the Earth's surface. And of course, there are many domains in which these things are true too. Uh, we're able to do time-critical crit time work now, where we have impending disasters, possibly uh, debris flows, floods, in the co as a consequence of, uh, of major earthquakes, <coughs> where literally minutes are important and having preparation that will um, translate the measurement of an earthquake into the implications downstream, debris flows, flooding and the like uh, is crucially important. There are many domains such as that, the tsunami is a good, is, is a good example. Uh, and we now have after the Sendai meeting um, a couple of months ago in Japan, where the international community was looking at ways in which, in, in which disaster monitoring and response could be enhanced. Um, it, these sorts of technologies that I'm illustrating here will be absorbed into those processes. So big data is good. Um, we must um, have open data to support um, scientific publication. But more, more broadly, why is sharing so important? Well, I bring in George Bernard Shaw, well-known Irish novelist and maverick, if you like, uh, for his evidence, if, you, if I have an apple, you have an apple, then you and I, if we exchange them, we'll have just one apple each. Got an idea, if you've got an idea, I've got an idea, we exchange them, then each of us will have two ideas. And essentially what digital technology is now permitting us to do is to double, to treble, to quadru quadruple those ideas um, through a process of sharing. It's a dynamic, which I think the scientific community, the research community in general, is beginning to recognize and hope and I think build on. This is a, a, a splendid example of, of the whole scientific community uh, doing these things. Um, this is the uh, European Molecular Biology Lab um, and its Elixir program which is now being rolled out internationally. And if you look around that, that circle, that circuit, um, top left is the earth, something you want to measure, some biological phenomenon, you sequence the DNA uh, from the phenomenon, um, labs around the world contribute uh, that data to the Alexia program, which archives it, classifies it, it shares it with other data providers, it analyzes and, and adds value to it, it provides tools for researchers to use it in their own ways, um, such that the enterprise is immensely, uh, immensely creative. And it certainly in my view, it's these bottom-up initiatives to create really powerful resources, much more powerful than we've had in the past, which are going to be important in driving the open data uh, initiative forward. And of course, there are some recent examples uh, of rapid open collaboration between laboratories worldwide, in this particular case of a severe gastrointestinal infection in Hamburg, um, which over a, a relatively small period of time permitted those laboratories by, by working together uh, to come up with a series of recommendations which when put in the hands of public health authorities worldwide would have given them the opportunity of countering a highly infectious outbreak had it become more dispersed. Of course the second one here is 
that relates to the rise of global antibiotic resistance where data sharing is absolutely crucial. But it's also important to recognize there are lots of other ways other than these relatively conventional ways of doing science which can ex exploit new technologies in, in highly imaginative and, and valuable ways. This is Tim Gowers. Tim is a Fields Medalist in Mathematics, um, equivalent to a Nobel Prize. Uh, and about five years ago, he put on his blog site an unsolved problem, uh, uh, which had been unsolved for many, many decades. He put, he put down a series of ideas about how one might address it. About 27 people with 800 substantive contributions contributed ideas. They were rapidly worked through, uh, and they claimed after a month the problem had been solved. Indeed, they solved a rather more difficult generalization of the problem rather than the specific one that had been posed. Tim's comment, it's like driving a car whilst normal research is like pushing it. So why do we do more of this? And the answer is a very, very simple one. It is that the criteria for credit and promotion are adapted to old ways of doing things. And it's the first author art article in Nature or Science. And the problem really is to analyze what has been absolutely fundamental to the scientific and research process over the last 100, 200 years, and what has simply grown up as a matter of convenience and habit, which inhibits the development of new technologies, which will permit the scientific community to be much more creative and have much better productivity. So a simple conclusion that you might draw, um, given the way in which this machine is, uh, is massacring my, my lovely diagrams, <laughs> is that all we need to do to, to openly exploit the data deluge, which is to have processes or tools for acquisition, curation, storage, management, access, reuse, and citation, all of which exist to a greater or lesser degree. And surely we should just say to researchers and their institutions, just do it. There's no problem. Well, actually, no, there is a problem. There are lots of them. Jim Gray, the late Jim Gray, was a, 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 an extraordinary um, data science guru. And this is a quote from something that Jim wrote. When you see what scientists are doing day in and day out in data analysis, it's truly dreadful. We're embarrassed by our data. And I just listed a series of, series of problems here. One of the problems, I think, is that many of the simple statistical techniques that we utilize in analyzing data are derived from an era when we didn't have much data, it wasn't necessarily terribly good, and classical statistics was developed primarily to permit us to exploit that sort of setting. Now, of course, what's happened is that we've inverted the whole process, whereby the data volumes are enormous, and we do need to rethink the way in which we utilize statistical approaches in order that our inferences are valid. So it's no good just having beautifully managed data that's open and the rest of it. We've also got to think quite profoundly about the processes by which we move from data to inference. Uh, and indeed, it's one of those domains where we need to get our mathematical colleagues involved in a very, very serious way. And of course, many of them, many of them are. One of, the, one of the problems, of course, in all this is, is exemplified here. Let's say we have a lot of Earth observation systems and systems of systems. On the right-hand side, you see there's the globe with all these, uh, all these uh, satellite rotating satellites uh, uh, acquiring data, which we then feed into, into servers. And uh, we can generate algorithms which are able to dis distinguish properties of the uh, Earth and, and very frequently properties that before have lain be below our capacity to resolve. We see, we see patterns there which we haven't seen before. The question then arises, how is a multi-component analysis delivered to the human brain? Well, typically, of course, it's through um, uh, some uh, uh, illustrative means. So in former times, we had two variables we plotted on a graph. How do we do a 40-component analysis? How do we comprehend that? Is there a possibility? Well, actually, if there is a possibility, and indeed it's being realized in some domains, there's a disconnect between machine analysis and human cognition. So what might be the role in some of these domains where machines are extremely powerful analyzers of, 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 of vari variability? Um, it's a sort of black box, uh, and, and can we look inside it? Of course, another key issue is who owns the black box? Uh, is it Google or some ICT company or is it in the public domain? 
And, and what does it mean to be a researcher in a data intensive age? Now, I don't propose to answer those questions. Time is too long. You might want to ask about them. But it seems to me that it is not absolutely obvious that the thing which has been the agent of at least material progress during human history, which is knowledge, um, much of which has in the past been in the public domain, but of course there's always been a knowledge intelligentsia. What, it, what ought to be a concern to us is the potential that knowledge should become privatized. And, we, and, and, and might it be that we could conceive of a tragedy of the commons for new knowledge? That's clearly something we have to be wary of. In a, in a sense, one of the ways in which we can see the, these various strands of, of use by the scientific community of new technologies um, could be almost exemplified by an, a possibility that's there now and is actually being implemented. And that is one where we have all the data open and online, we have all the publications open and online, and for, and for them to interoperate. And those of you that have looked at things, at, say PubMed, and seen some of the active uh, interactions there between data which can be called up whilst you're reading paper, which then permits you to manipulate the data in a variety of ways, you begin to see it. what's happening is an environment's being created, which can, can be a realization of the sorts of things that I've been, I, I've been talking about, although very large questions still, still remain. I now want to talk a little bit about the way in which some of these big issues um, might be realized or are being realized in practice. And I think the first thing we have to recognize is that Although science is an international enterprise, um, most of us do our science through national systems, and those national systems vary in the nature of the incentives that there are for us to do science, the nature of funding, the processes of, 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 uh, of organization of science. So in a sense, there needs to be a, a national system that supports the sorts of processes that I've been talking about which will involve necessarily involve major changes in institutions. But I think a national system can be characterized quite simply in these in the terms that I show here. And, th and that is that uh, uh, at the bottom you see I put national policies and e infrastructure. National policies really are about governments uh, expressing a view about the importance of open research, open science, um, and indeed open government data and, uh, and other. Uh, other sorts of data, of ensuring that the infrastructure is in place in order to, to manipulate uh, data, um, and then we need to ensure that institutional management is such and support is such that scientists and groups in institutions can operate effectively in an open research data environment, and that support uh, should be for both big data analytics on the one hand, which is related to the Jim Gray quotation, uh, and the other one to open research data, the two of which interact. And then, of course, there are the scientific or research inferences we make on the basis of that analysis. Uh, we need to ensure that the process of inference is a valid one, and then the, the knowledge output. And of course, the key thing is that those of us that are paid from the public purse, the presumption is the knowledge we are creating is knowledge which society, um, in principle, should be able, should it wish to, use in a productive and helpful way. Clearly, it's in the interests of society as a whole that those institutions that generate the data should be aware of the different audiences which they are there to serve. There are challenges in all this for, for institutions and individuals at, at all levels. At the highest level, governments need to, ex to express a policy for open research data, that this is important, it matters, will benefit them nationally and in relation to national priorities. Then those that fund research and those responsible for strategy for research, uh, very often they um, are the ones that determine the incentives for research for the bodies that they fund. They need to accept that the cost of open data is the cost of science. Uh, I would argue you can't say uh, well, which do we do? Do we either do a science or do we have open data? I would say that open data is science, and science without open data isn't science. It's as simple as that. And that they should mandate intelligent openness when projects are completed and data is, data is deposited. The publishers, we need to have them mandate concurrent open deposition and to recognize that it is, a, in my view at least, malpractice 
for that not to take place. University institutes have really difficult problems. I've referred to the, the issue of incentives and promotion criteria, which they need to think about. They need to be proactive and not compliant. What I mean by that, a few years ago, when this whole issue began to take off in the UK, then as governments and research councils expressed uh, a, a, a need for a move in this direction, uh, many universities said, well, what's the minimum we can do to satisfy those requirements? Uh, the minimum that won't cost as much money and which won't deflect staff. What I think now is beginning to happen is that many universities, possibly even most, are beginning to recognize that the future excellence of the, and relevance of the research that they, they do in their institutions depends on them being proactive in this domain. That's a fundamental uh, hurdle to get over. Once you're over it, then in a sense, the system starts to drive the priorities that I've been talking about. But universities also need to think about the way they manage their data and have management processes able to create open, open data which are utilized by their own people and others, and also to support the use of data by their scientists. The library function is a key issue and many universities are struggling with that at the moment. And I would argue that many of our libraries now, particularly in science, are, are doing the wrong things and employing the wrong people. And of course, we also need to think about training, but I'll come back to that shortly. And fundamental at the base of that, is changing the mindset and the incentives of we scientists. We need to think about this data not being our data anymore. I and mean, I have as, probably as good an excuse as anyone to say it's mine. I go to cold, miserable, and awful places for many months to get it. But the reality is it isn't. Our fellow citizens through our taxes have paid for the data that we've collected. And as a consequence, we should regard ourselves simply as custodians of data on their part. The function of research is, is not to give nice careers for scientists, it's to provide knowledge for society as a whole, although giving scientists a good career is an excellent way of making sure you get good people in. But you've got to get the argument the right way around. And of course, one of the big challenges, I think, is engaging with citizens, which I'm not going to have time to talk about today. This is a useful analysis. Uh, it's a slide from Tony Hay, who many of you will know. It's about skills and roles. If we think about domain researchers, biologists, geologists, social scientists, do they need to become informaticians, data scientists? My answer, we know they don't. I prefer my biologist to be able to distinguish between a lion and a tiger rather than necessarily to do complex, complex analyses of statistics. Uh, however, we need to ensure, first of all, they are better educated and better trained in appropriate database te data techniques and uh, uh, and be aware of the responsibilities that fall on their shoulders. Tony suggested we could we we could subdivide data specialists or data scientists into data engineers who operate at a low level, close to the data, write code uh, and the like. Data analysts who explore data through statistical and analytical techniques and give strong support to scientists in doing that. Um, data stewards, those who manage, curate and preserve data, or information specialists, archivists. They're, they're the librarians, if you like, for the post-Gutenberg world. Uh, in the UK, we've tried to respond to these things by bringing together what we call a research data forum, which is about 30 to 35 people representing key components of what we might think of as the UK science system. That's the funders, the publishers, the university people, researchers, various uh, uh, various other bodies, British Library, GIS, which many of you will know about. And its purpose is to drive practical change, not to act as a talk shop, so we're publishing shortly a concordat about the principles that underlie open data in the UK, which we expect everyone to sign up to. We are driving the use of data site as an important, uh, uh, is an important tool uh, and, and, analogous, uh, and analogous things. Um, and that's really part of the, the national efforts that are required that are sensitive to national cultures and ways of doing things. But then there's the international uh, scene and at the moment, there are three formal bodies which operate in this domain um, with overlapping interests. All of them are involved in advocacy, but in detail, rather different aspects um, of this whole issue. And of course, the key thing for those of us that are involved, I'm, I'm involved as president of CoData, the key thing for all of us there is to ensure that we collaborate and coordinate our activities because the resources available at an international level are still very small compared with the size of the 
community, and therefore it's got to be efficient and as collaborative as, as possible. So that's all been about open data. The legitimate question, I think, is what's this all about anyway? Many people have referred to open science, and this would be my definition of what open science might be. I think there are three component parts. It's doing science openly, it's having open data, and it's having open access publication. In the open data domain, of course, I tend to have been talking about sort of university-type research. <clears throat> There's also, of course, administrative data held by public authorities. There's public sector research data like meteorological offices, but then there's research data of the type that many of us know and love. Uh, and those are the, the, the uh, data and publication, the outputs, if you like. Outputs for whom? Okay. Well, researchers, government, businesses, citizens, citizen scientists. I think we, we feed the researcher community reasonably well. From what I've said, you'll have gathered not as well as I think we ought to. Government and public sector, we try quite hard to service them well, but I'm not sure we do a good job. Businesses set themselves up to take what data they need from the research community, uh, and it's a question of how efficient and how aware they are. Citizens, I think we suffer, we, we do not serve well. And my view is that we really have to address that issue uh, very seriously, because ultimately I would argue that this is about science being a public enterprise and not a private one conducted behind closed laboratory doors. Why should it be public? I think there are two reasons. The first one is that science has, science is, and science will continue to change the world we live in, change our economies, it will continue to change many of the aspects that determine how our society works. As a consequence, in a democratic society, then we need to ensure that citizens too are aware of these issues and are able, in some sense, able to, able to partake in them. And at the largest level, I would say this is ultimately about democracy. It's about a society which has knowledge, which has some understanding, and where politicians, their elected politicians, can be, can, can be brought to account. Because knowledge in the public domain is as great as knowledge contained within, within the governmental domain. If you have a system where government has the monopoly of knowledge, you have a tyranny. Thanks.